Last week, my wife and I went for our pensioner's flu jab. And within two days, we both had it. And I've been without a voice for a whole week, so it's touch and go. But uh, you pray. And I'd like to talk to the Lord before I talk to you. Holy Father, I'm very weak and you're very strong. So I pray that you'll demonstrate that today for my brethren's sake and for your reputation's sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> One hour. I'm grateful for two sessions. I'm grateful for two sessions entitled Presenting the Word, and I'd like to begin by telling you how we're going to divide the two sessions. The first will be how my message developed, and the second will be how my method developed. In other words, the first this morning will be on content of preaching, and this afternoon on communication. My definition of preaching is declaring the whole truth to the whole person. And we'll consider the whole truth now and this afternoon the whole person. And we shall look at how to reach the five parts of every member of your congregations. How to involve their bodies, which is very important. How to interest their mind. How to incite their heart. How to influence their will. And above all, how to inspire their spirit. That's a little foretaste for the five subjects this afternoon. This morning, my message is in six parts because my preaching has gone through six phases, each quite different from the previous one. My approach will be autobiographical because I don't feel I'm here to tell you how to preach. I'm going to tell you how the Lord led me in preaching and may he give you the wisdom to know what is relevant for you and what is unique to me. Since preaching is truth through personality, preaching will be as different as every person in this room. And you must not copy anyone, you must not imitate anyone, but pick up from other preachers what is relevant to you. I've found that so often you discover your calling in resonating with somebody exercising it. And sometimes hearing another preacher resonates with you and you know you ought to be doing that as well. So, my own story, it's a unique story because I'm unique and so are you. And it may be very different from other stories of preachers here. My first attempt to preach was a failure. The congregation numbered three, and I was aged ten. <laughs> For some reason, my father was away, and we couldn't get to church. I don't know why. And so my mother said, we're going to have a service here at home. And you, David, will preach. And she and my two sisters were the congregation. So I turned an armchair backwards and used the back of it for my pulpit. And I remember expounding the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. First of all, I read through Matthew 20. Then I retold the story how he went out at the third, sixth, and ninth hour to find workers. And then I went through the story a third time to draw some message from each part of the story. And at that point, my elder sister, in a tone of frustration and exasperation, said, isn't that vineyard full yet? <laughs> and the service came to an untimely and an unseemly end. And as far as I recall, the experiment was never repeated. <laughs> that was proof to me that heredity and environment do not make a preacher. Because if anybody in this room had a preaching heredity and a preaching environment, your speaker did. I have here three books. The first, The Letters of John Pawson. And he was one of Wesley's first 12 preachers, a Wakefield farmer in Yorkshire. 
And the letters are fascinating. And then my grandfather was a Methodist minister, more an evangelist, because when they published his story, they entitled it Harvesting for God. And there was my granddad with the same little beard. That was quite unconscious, but there it is, Harvesting for God. My father was not a minister or an evangelist. He was a pro professor of agriculture in Newcastle University. But at weekends, he was a Methodist local preacher. And he always preached for a verdict. And in fact, he kept a book in which he wrote the name and address of everybody who responded to his regular appeals when he preached. When he died, the book came into my possession and there were 12,000 names in it. There are many evangelists who couldn't match that and he was doing it in his spare time. His mentor was a man called Samuel Chadwick, principal of Cliff College, who adopted my father. So I guess Chadwick is my spiritual grandfather. But the model for my father on which he modeled his preaching was a former pastor of this very church, J.H. Jowett, who was called the Prince of Preachers. And so with all that heredity, it sh preaching should be in my blood. But that didn't lead me to preach. What about environment? I had the most extraordinary boyhood in Newcastle on time because our home was called the Preacher's Inn. And any w well known preacher who came to preach on Tyne's side stayed in our home. So I met most of them. I just jotted down some of the names. From Scotland, James Black, James S. Stewart, William Barclay. From England, William Wallace, Norman Dunning, John Broadbelt, S. W. Hughes. From London, Campbell Morgan, Townley Lord, Martin Lloyd Jones. And the three Methodist preachers, Sangster, Weatherhead, and Soper of whom it was said that Sangster loved the Lord, Weatherhead loved people, and Soper loved an argument. <laughs> from, from overseas came saints like Kagawa from Japan and Martin Niemöller from Germany, and all these preachers and many, many more stayed in our home. Yet I never heard any of them preach. I saw them out of the pulpit. And maybe that's why I didn't get any desire to preach <laughs> from them. So there I was with all that preaching in my heredity and surrounded as a boy with all these well-known preachers. And yet that didn't help at all. My mother was an amateur photographer, always into the latest thing, and she made movie films of all these preachers and called it Preachers Out of the Pulpit. And so I have at home a suitcase packed with old film, 9.5 millimeter and 16 millimeter of all these preachers off duty. So I, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth as far as preaching was concerned, but had no ambition to be a preacher and no desire to be a preacher. Isn't that extraordinary? But it just goes to show that that's not the real factor. Most of the preachers we did have in our home were free church because this was pre-John Stott. And there weren't that many Anglican preachers of the quality that uh, came to preach on Tyne's side. There are now. Well now, in the late 40s, after World War II, there was a widespread desire in England to build a new society. That's what brought the Labour government in immediately after the war. The desire to start afresh. And many evangelists took advantage of that desire to hold crusades just after World War II. And they came to Newcastle. And I began to listen then and began to study preaching in them. The first was not uh, Johnny Wilkinson, <laughs> but it was the best known rugby player in the Northeast, a great big giant of a man called Alan Redpath. 
And he came to Newcastle, and I was very impressed with this great man with shoulders this wide talking about Jesus. And then came a rather thin, lanky young man in the name of Youth for Christ, with a name we were later to hear as Billy Graham. And he came. And then came my cousin, a man called Tom Reese, who used to say he had a little mission hall in Kensington called the Royal Albert Hall, <laughs> which he packed month after month after month in those days. He also had Hildenborough Hall in Kent, a conference center for young people. And I went there in 1947. And after one week, I realized it was high time that I lived on my own faith and not on my parents' faith. And I went back to the farm where I was working, getting up at four in the morning to milk 90 cows. And I, I found myself singing choruses to the cows at four o'clock in the morning. Years later, farmers were to discover that playing music in the cow shed increased <laughs> milk yield. I can claim to have been the discoverer, but that was never acknowledged. But, but I found myself bursting to tell the world about Jesus. And I began to preach, not in churches, but in the open air, outside cinema queues, down at the beach at Whitley Bay, anywhere there were people, I would get up and preach. My pulpit, not like this, was an ex-U.S. Army Jeep, and I would park it anywhere there were people. Very soon, there were 70 or 80 young people joined me, and we learned how to preach in pubs, working men's clubs, down the coal mines in County Durham and County Northumberland anywhere that people would give us a hearing. Looking back, I'm grateful that I began there. It taught me quite a lot without my realizing it. But I want to take from that time on what happened to my preaching and how the Lord led me through six different phases. I was very friendly with a converted bookmaker who lived in County Durham, and I went to tea with him one Sunday and uh, he said, I knew he was preaching in a place called Spennymoor that evening, and I went with him on the bus. I said, Jack, what are you going to preach on tonight? He said, I'm not preaching tonight. You are. <laughs> and that was my first introduction to preaching in a pulpit in a church. I got through my whole testimony, quoted every text I could remember, <laughs> and shared every bit of doctrine I had in seven to eight minutes flat, <laughs> a feat I have never been able to repeat. <laughs> and so now I'm preaching in churches, Methodist chapels, for being brought up a Methodist. That was the only denomination I knew at that time. And so in Methodist chapels around the Northeast, I was preaching. My first phase was what I call testimony preaching. Highly subjective, very me-centered. A lot of my testimony and my experience came in. And for the matter in my sermons, it was scriptures that meant something to me. Or scriptures I had discovered, or scriptures through which God had spoken to me. It was very much me subjective testimony preaching. It's not a bad place to begin, but it's not a good place to stay. Scriptures were also highly selective, and because I limited my preaching at that stage to my experience, there was no eschatology and no pneumatology in it. I never talked about the Holy Spirit because I had no conscious relationship with him at that stage. That would come some time later. I never preached about heaven and hell because I had no experience of heaven or hell. Those were to come later. So I wasn't preaching the whole truth by any manner of means, but a highly subjective selection of the word of God. Hap happily that passed. And I went into my second phase, which I call text preaching. I picked that up from the Methodist preacher's habits, 
they all began with, my text this morning is. And then they would give one verse out of the Bible and then expound it. Looking back, it was often a text out of context being a pretext. Just one verse to hang some thoughts on. But I got into text preaching. That, of course, again, was highly subjective and highly selective. Which text did I choose? The ones I wanted to preach on. Or the ones that I thought other people might be interested in my preaching. But still, it was not the whole truth by a very long way. And in fact, in Methodist circuits, as you probably know, you don't have a pastoral uh, teaching opportunity. You are going around a circuit of maybe up to 30 churches. So you only needed four sermons a year. <laughs> and you could trail them around one place after another, like that. And so four texts a year would see you through. Again, nowhere near the whole truth and still only touching a tiny percentage of God's word. I then moved into what I would call topic preaching. Bought myself a big fat Bible called Nave's Topical Bible. Thought it was a wonderful book. Why hadn't God thought of doing it this way? <laughs> Every verse in the Bible was in a chapter under a heading, Humility. And every verse related in the Bible was right there. And all you need to do if you wanted to preach on the topic of humility was turn up the relevant page and bang, 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 bang. Nowadays, you do it with a computer and a printout. But it's the same. And it disturbs me, frankly, that so much of contemporary preaching is topical. Once again, it suffers from being subjective. Which topic are you going to choose? Are you going to get at your congregation next Sunday with a topic that you feel is right up their street and where they're at? Where the rubber hits the road or where, where it itches? Well, that meant at least that I was getting texts from all over the Bible and not just having one solitary verse as the base for my preaching, but many verses, multiple texts. The problem was that everyone was taken out of context and was only selected because it related to the overall topic. A dear old lady uh, said to me quite recently, I'm getting sick of topical preaching. She said, I call it chasing through the Bible to prove a point. And I thought that was quite a discerning remark. Congregation, now look at this, now look at that, now look at the other, chasing after the preacher to try and keep up and never asking, how are these texts being used? Are they true to context? Is that the real meaning? Or is that the meaning the preacher wants us to find? Well now, it was while I was still in my topical phase that I was called by the Methodist Church into the Royal Air Force. And that's another story. But it meant switching from lifeboat congregations that's women and children first. <laughs> to, to congregations more like this morning. Hundreds of men. And I had a pocket full of sermons that I preached in Methodist circuits, little realizing they would go off like a lead balloon with a bunch of men. I discovered that men want a very different kind of preaching to that which I'd unconsciously adopted when facing a congregation largely women and children. Men want it straight from the shoulder. They want to know what you're saying, straight. Even if they disagree and come and argue afterwards, what are you getting at? They don't want pussyfooting around, as they put it to me. And so with a congregation of up to 2,000 men, it was a very different kettle of fish for me. And I despaired at first of ever finding out how to reach them. And I sought the Lord about it. And something happened then which was to change the course of my life, as well as my preaching. I felt the Lord say, I want you to preach my whole word. What do you mean, Lord? Well, the Bible. All of it? 
Yes. From generation to revolution, the whole lot? Yes. And I announced to the men in the Royal Air Force, I was by now out in Arabia, that I was going to take them through the whole Bible in a few months. <laughs> if we'd had run trainers on, we could have done it in about a few weeks. But we galloped through the entire Bible with spikes in our shoes over about eight months. And I took them from beginning to end of God's purpose. I was totally shaken by the result. These men, for the first time, were, were seeing and grasping the whole purpose of God. They were getting a big view, not little bits, not little pep talks, not little bits of moral advice. They were getting the purposes of God from beginning to end. They got more and more excited. And even now, so many decades later, wherever I go in the country, there's usually a lad in the RAF who came to Christ through that systematic biblical teaching. Now that was to set me on a very different course. However, I did not want to go back into the Methodist circuit life because there would be no opportunity whatever to give that kind of teaching. Sunday by Sunday, running around circuits. That was one reason but there was another reason why I came to part from the church of my fathers. And that was, now I was teaching the whole Bible, I could not avoid certain passages or certain subjects, which I'd either been blind to before, or didn't want to tackle because they were somehow disturbing. And one of them in particular was the theme of baptism. And I found myself so convinced by what I was studying in the Word that I had to say to the Methodist Conference, I can no longer do babies. Bless them, they were so keen to keep me that they offered me a full-time deaconess to do all the babies. <laughs> but I said, no, that would be dishonest. And in any case, I shall now be preaching a different kind of baptism. Now, put those two things together, and it meant I had to resign from the Methodist ministry with no future. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm going to lose my job, my pension, and our house. And she said, I want to be married to a man who obeys God and that was it. And in an amazing way, within a week, we found ourselves pastor of Gold Hill Baptist Church in Buckinghamshire and living in a brand new house. And I discovered then that the Lord is the best employer. I discovered also that he doesn't ever call anybody to a denominational post. I mean by that I realized he hadn't called me to be a Methodist preacher or a Baptist preacher, but to be a preacher to his body. And that he would move me around as necessary. But it was to his body. And I believe firmly now that I was not called to the Methodist ministry or the Baptist ministry, but to the ministry of the body of Christ, wherever he put me. And so for the first time I now had a pulpit every week. And I was now able to take that very brief survey of Scripture, the whole of the Bible, which we'd done in the Royal Air Force, and begin to do it in depth. My target was to take a congregation right through the Bible every ten years. That involved one chapter from the New Testament each service, or two to three chapters from longer books in the Old Testament every service. And I gave myself now to the fourth phase, testimony preaching, text preaching, topic preaching, but now I would call it passage preaching. And for the first time was wrestling with context and was finding, and I just say this for your information, 
finding that you have to spend one hour in the study for five minutes in the pulpit if you're really going to preach the Word of God. I know of no shortcut. 90% inspiration and 10% perspiration. No, the other way. <laughs> other way round. But my wife would bear this out. And I felt it was so important to be able to feed my people that I made that the priority in time and didn't allow other things to steal the time that I needed to get to grips with the Word of God. My aim was fourfold. First, to make that preaching real. And that meant going back into the past and reliving it with my people, with imagination and information, taking them backwards into those days so that they could live in it. And above all, and I'll say much more about this this afternoon, so that they could feel the Word of God and not just think it. I've come to the conclusion that people only really respond to the Word of God with enthusiasm and readiness when they feel it as well as think it. When it's gone in here and not just here. We'll talk about how to do that this afternoon. And so the second thing was make it real, make it relevant to come back from the past into today and ask how that relates to our situation now. Again, no shortcut. We first had to go back into the past because every word of Scripture has what the Germans call a Sitz im Leben, a situation in life. And God did not give us a topical Bible. Wouldn't it be nice if the first book in the Bible was all about salvation and the second book was all about prayer and the third book... That's what we try and make it with our topical preaching, but it's not how God gave us his word. Everything he said was given into a life situation. Real people in a real situation. And what God said was related to that situation. That was the context of everything God says. And that's why he's given us a Bible which is largely narrative and story. Because his revelation comes through the story. The third thing, I wanted it to be reliable. Now just to divert for a moment into actual method, I would sit with my Bible and the passage for next Sunday and a pile of plain paper and sit there until I'd filled page after page after page with what I could get for myself out of that passage and what I understood for myself it meant. Many times I would translate the Bible into my own language to make sure that I understood it. I wanted it to be absolutely reliable in terms of true to that scripture. That was probably the longest time of preparation. I would only look at other commentaries and other writers of not other preachers, I refused to read what other preachers said, but I looked up commentaries and others only after I had enough material of my own and was ready to check out what I'd found with what others found. It didn't always agree. And then I had to wrestle with, have I misunderstood it? Or have they? But that was all part of being a reliable expositor. And finally, I wanted to be refreshing. This is what I call putting the gravy on the meat. Making it tasty, making it interesting, making it lively. And again, I'll talk more this afternoon about that. How to interest the mind. I think the unforgivable sin in a preacher is to be boring, don't you? Now, through that period, I had found my gifting and my calling. I was a teacher. I know it comes fifth in the list in Ephesians, the ascension gifts you will hear about. That doesn't worry me at all. I don't mind being bottom if it's in an order of hierarchy, but that's my gifting. And I have 
long since discovered that it's freedom to live within your gifting and not try to be what you're not. It's freedom to discover what you are and it's freedom to discover what you're not and stay within your gifting, which I've tried to do. Now, it was as I began this expository ministry, of course, I found soon that it was an open sesame to evangelical conventions. I began to get invitations to go and teach the Bible elsewhere. And then I had to go and ruin it all and become charismatic. <laughs> and I found that shut all the doors that had opened so readily. In fact, I'll tell you something. I remember dear John Stott saying to me, David, have you lost all your critical faculties? <laughs> I don't think I've ever had such critical faculties as I've had since I got to know the Spirit. But there it was. And I ruined it all. But God had other plans. There was a man in the church who had an old-fashioned tape recorder with spools. And he didn't agree with much of my preaching. He was what's called a Berean and had the most unusual views and uh, didn't believe in the sacraments for us, for example, baptism of the Lord's Supper, and th there it was. But he was a, a, a delightful, kind man. And he said, David, I want to tape your sermons for the sick and the elderly in the congregation so that they don't miss them. I said, fine, you go ahead. I don't mind. Little dreaming what that was going to mean. Ultimately, it would mean being a missionary in 120 countries without any hassle. But we didn't know at that stage, nor did he know. But it grew and it grew, even with the old spools. But I praise God, then came the invention of the audio cassette, which is used in the same form worldwide. What a gift to the body of Christ that little cassette was. And it came in and we immediately seized on it because by then tapes were beginning to circulate everywhere. As I was asking the Lord about this, I felt he was saying something like this, David, now I can use your preaching on a wider scale. I couldn't use your testimony preaching or your text preaching or your topic preaching, but your passage preaching I can use and I'm going to use on a very wide scale. I found that encouraging. I felt I'd touched something that I was made for. The big advantage, of course, of such systematic teaching is that you have to touch things you don't want to touch. And you can touch them without getting at members of the congregation because it's there in the text and you are driven to it and you have to preach it. Topical preaching always has that problem, who's he getting out this morning? But systematic sets you free and you have to preach the whole counsel of God. I loved it. And one of the things I did, which I commend to you to consider, all the Bible school teachers on Sunday morning, of course, missed the main teaching in the Sunday morning service. And so I decided to meet with all the Bible school teachers on Thursday evening and give them the study then so that they weren't robbed of teaching. Not only did that have a profound effect on their Sunday school teaching, but it had a good effect on me. It meant that I could try a sermon out every week before giving it. And it helped me enormously to have that dry run on a Thursday evening before Sunday morning. Well, now that went on for years, right through my ministry in Guildford. Systematic passage preaching. I still, I don't think I've covered every chapter in the Bible, but I've covered a great deal. And there's now a library of some 1,100 tapes from that era. Then in 1979, <coughs> I was praying about the church in Milmead and the future of it and I could see very clearly the way the church should go and what God's plans for the next decade were. 
but I couldn't see my place in it. And that was quite disturbing. I went away to what's called a prayer and Bible week in Ashburnham Place. Some of you will have been there. And uh, I said, Lord, during this week, please, will you tell me clearly whether I'm to be part of the future of the church or not? I need to know. By the way, that's just a little insight into the way I seek guidance from the Lord. He is Lord, he is boss. It's not my job to try and read his mind. It's his job to tell me. Do you understand what I've said? If you go to an office or factory on Monday morning, the boss doesn't come to you and say, try and guess what I want you to do this week. <laughs> Yet that's how we treat God. And I made a solemn promise to the Lord years and years ago, Lord, if you speak clearly to me, I promise to obey, whatever the cost or consequence. If you tell me clearly to go to such and such a place, I will go. And if you tell me clearly what you want said in that place, I will say it. But it's your job to tell me clearly. It's not my job to read your mind. And I just say simply, that has worked. He's kept his part and I, by his grace, have kept mine. In fact, to go back to the very beginning when I was still working on the farm, I was torn between farming and preaching because I was doing both. Now, I could have gone on doing both, but I felt it was going to be an either-or. And one morning I said to the Lord, Lord, if you will tell me by midday today which it's to be in your will, I'll do it. At 10.30, I'm having a cup of coffee with another farm worker, and he looked at me straight in the eye and said, David, you won't finish up behind a plow, you'll finish up in a pulpit. I said, that's not clear enough, Lord. <laughs> and, and I left him. I left him, and I could take you to the very spot in a street in Newcastle on Tyne, where after I'd left him, I bumped into a retired Methodist minister whom I hadn't seen for years. And I said, how are you, Mr. Scott? Nice to see you again. David, why are you not in the ministry? I said, that's clear enough. <laughs> and I have found that. And I really believe that people who make such a meal of guidance would be better saying to the Lord, you speak to me clearly and I'll do it. If you don't speak to me clearly, I'll go on doing what I'm doing already. Which is how you would behave towards your boss at work. If he didn't tell you something new on a Monday morning, you'd assume he wanted you to do what he did, you did on Friday. And go on. Far too many people leave something and then seek guidance for something else. Instead of staying put and continuing what they're doing until he clearly says, move. Well, in 1979, here I was at the Prayer and Bible Week. And I'll tell you who was uh, one of the speakers, Alex Buchanan, who was on this platform uh, a few weeks ago for Derek Prince's funeral memorial service. And when he'd finished speaking, giving one of his talks, he said, I have a word from the Lord for four men here. He said, I don't know who they are, but you will know. And he began, the first three words, I can't recall anything, but the fourth, I can recite. My son, you have ministered to the extent of your gift in the place where I certainly put you. And I set you free from that place, and I set the land before you. But one thing I require of you, that you surrender into my hands all that remains to be done in that place, for it is my church and my congregation. And I want you to go out and so serve me that one day you will look into my face and say, Lord, we did it. We did it. And I understood very clearly, by the way, I took a recording back to the elders of the church 
I would not do anything until they weighed and judged it. And they said, we've got to let you go. And he set the land before me. And within two years, I'd been in 200 towns and cities in this land. But what a change it made to my preaching. No longer could I work through passage after passage. You're in a place for one, two, or at most three days. And you've got to raise the dead in that time. <laughs> it's a very different matter. Funnily enough, I found that I returned to a form of topic preaching. And that was because as I traveled around, burdens came heavily on my heart. Burdens for the church as God's people. I began to live on a wide canvas, no longer parochial. How easy it is to assume that the whole church is a mirror of your own little patch. That if you're having a blessed time, there's a revival around the corner. Or if you're struggling, we're in the last days. It's so easy to project your situation onto a wider front. But now I was seeing the wider front. And I began to what I now call burden preach. Not really topic, burden. As I picked it up, it became heavy in my heart. I would begin to share it with a seminar here and a meeting there, but it would get bigger and bigger. And then I, I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, when you've given me a burden for the church, it's a very inefficient method to take it here and there and there. I could spend the rest of my life in a jumbo jet taking one burden around the world. What can I do? Surely there must be a more efficient way of handling these burdens. And I opened my Bible at Jeremiah. By the way, he's the man I identify with. Do you have a, a person in the Bible that you identify with? Jeremiah's mine. Looking forward to meeting him. And my Bible fell open where he told Jeremiah, write what I have said to you in a book. Now publishers had been after me for books and I'd steadfastly said, no, I'm not a writer. I don't want to write books. I'm not into that. I don't think it's my calling. But now God said, when you get a burden, I want you to share it around the country, get feedback, share it with others, and then write a book. And when I did that, and the book was written, the burden lifted. So it was burden preaching that became burden writing. And uh, so far it's been about 20 burdens. The first was that I found that many Christians are badly birthed. They have not had a good midwife when they were born again. I discovered in the New Testament there are four necessary steps into the kingdom of God. To repent toward God, the Father. To believe in Jesus the Son at his right hand. To be baptized in water and to receive the Holy Spirit. And I found that many Christians around the country were missing one, two and even three out of the four. And when I began to counsel Christians with big problems, I learned to forget the problem at the beginning and say, tell me how you were born again. Go back to your conversion. And I listened for these four things. And invariably, one or two are missing. I say, before we tackle your problem, let's get you properly birthed. Let's get the four dimensions in place. The four foundations. And when we did that, their problem either became small enough for them to cope with or even disappeared altogether. And I realized that Christians who've not been well birthed, who've simply said a sinner's prayer or Jesus come into my life, but not really repented, that was the one that was missing in most cases. No proof of repentance in deeds, which is what Paul always asked for. It may have been baptism was missing, or it may have been that they knew the Father and Son but didn't know the Holy Spirit.
But that became the book, The Normal Christian Birth. And my wife said, that's the most important book you'll ever write. And she's usually right, unfortunately. <laughs> and then I discovered that an eschatological gospel had been exchanged for an existential one. What do I mean by that? That a gospel of good news for the future had become preoccupied with the present. But to me, the gospel is eschatological. It's concerned with the future. It's the future breaking into the present. And I found that there were congregations who'd never heard a sermon on heaven or hell or even the day of judgment. They were being fed a diet of unconditional love of God for the now and had little concept of what God has prepared for those who love him. And we need that future dimension to live in the present. So I wrote, When Jesus Returns. Then I discovered that many people no longer believed in the eternal torment of hell. And evangelical Bible teachers didn't. And this had shaken the church. So I had to write a book on hell. Now my books have been widely misunderstood. The normal Christian birth, when it went to the British Library to be categorized, they put it under gynecology. <laughs> and it, it, it appears in all the public libraries under the medical section. But I've had some good letters from doctors and nurses. <laughs> and then when I wrote the book, The Road to Hell, it was advertised in a national Christian magazine under the heading, Read David Pawson's Autobiography. <laughs> So there it is. I found myself deeply burdened about the feminizing of the church and its increasingly effeminate character. God is needing men who are fearless. And I discovered this, that most women long to see strong men leading there are a few feminists who've attacked me. One Christian bookshop for leadership as male was handing it out in plain brown paper bags from under the counter, <laughs> as if it was pornographic. There was a, a feminist demonstration outside a Christian bookshop that had it in the window. Leadership is male was probably the best known and the least read book of 1988 but I have a stack file full of letters of thanks, every one from a woman, and saying, thank God, it was not putting women down, it was trying to put men where they should be. But it became an increasing burden. I was going to churches where the balance of the genders was five women to one man. That is no reflection of the population around us. Something is terribly wrong when we've got more women than men. So that was another burden. And it went on and on until the final burden I've published is the burden on Islam. And some of you know how about 15 months ago I had what I came to believe was a revelation of the Lord that Islam will become the dominant religion in this country and that God is allowing that to purify his church. It was a message I couldn't talk about even to my wife for six months. I lived with it. And then I began to share it and people said, David, you're just the person to say this. I've never had so many volunteering to stick my neck out. <laughs> so I planned a day's recording for video and tape with an invited audience at Waverley Abbey and a week before, I had a stroke which robbed me of my speech. And the doctors could find no physical cause. I've had every test imaginable. And they can't find. It only affected my throat and my lips and my tongue. But hundreds prayed and we were able to speak for five and a half hours when the day came though I finished standing on one leg because my left side had lost all control. But that is now a book. 
and it was published a month ago. And so I have been burden preaching for the last 20 years as I've picked up a burden, I've tried to get to grips with it, understand it. People said, what are you now, David? And I said, I'm still a teacher, but where I was a pastoral teacher, I'm now a prophetic teacher. The noun hasn't changed, but the adjective has. And I believe that can happen to every gifting. Most of us have a noun and an adjective. Apparently someone said to Martin Lloyd-Jones in his later years, is there any such thing as prophetic preaching in Britain today? And so I'm told, he said, I can name two. And one was my name. Unfortunately, the person didn't tell me about this until after he died. So I was never able to find out what he understood by that. But I understand it to be preaching a burden laid on you by the Lord and applying it to the situation. Now that was number five. How are we doing? Still got ten minutes. Haven't I? Five. My pinger says ten. <laughs> All right. The Lord, had, the Lord had one more surprise for me. A bunch of churches uh, up in the Thames Valley, represented here today actually, invited me to go and get their people back into the Bible. Now that is a burden I have because I find that even evangelicals no longer study the Bible for themselves. And the reason is that we don't give them the appetite and help them. And they said, would you come and get our people back into the Bible? I said, I'll come once a month for four months for three hours on a Sunday evening. You can have coffee in the middle if you like. And I will speak about one book in the Bible. And I will aim to do two things. First, to give them such an appetite for that book that they can't wait to read it. And second, to give enough information and analysis to help them to understand it when they do read it. That's the only twofold aim. We did it for four months. At the end of which the pastors came to me and said, please can we book you for six years? <laughs> I laughed. I said, I might be in heaven by then. But I did it actually. And over six years we went into every book in the Bible. And I then realized more fully than ever before that God never wanted chapter and verse numbers in the Bible. He didn't inspire them. It was a French bishop who divided it into chapters and an Irish bishop who divided the chapters into verses. And we became text people, proof text people. And in fact, the word text used to mean the whole Bible. The text of the Bible was the whole Bible. Now it means one sentence. We became chapter and verse people. How many of you could quote John 3.16 to me? Just put your hand up if you could. I won't ask you. How many could quote John 3.15? Or John 3.17? Just put your hand up. One, two. Do you see what I mean? There's the classic case of ripping a text out of its context. And you will not get the true meaning of it if you do that. We became chapter and verse people. But God in his wisdom did not give us his word in chapter and verse. He gave us his word in books. And every book in the Bible is unique and every one is written for a different reason. And the key to unlocking the Bible is to ask of each book, why was that book written? Because everything in that book will relate to the answer. Or you haven't understood the book. And so, over six years we went right through the Bible, one book at a time. Why was this book written? Why has God included it in the Bible? And what is its message for us today? And it's all that that is in the uh, red volume that you've seen earlier. 1,400 pages for under 10 pounds. It's a snip. <laughs> it's a giveaway. But it's packed with stuff. And I, people said to me, the Bible has become a new book to me. And I'm urging all people to treat the Bible as a library. It is not one book. 
The word Biblia is plural. It's books. It's not the book, it's the books. And each book has its unique. Why are there four Gospels? Because two are written for unbelievers and two are written for believers. And the two written for believers, one is for new believers and the other is for old believers. That's why the parable of the lost sheep in one gospel is the lost sinner. In another gospel, the lost sheep is a backsliding saint. And the reason why the gospel was written colors everything in it. That's why there are books of kings and books of chronicles. Did you ever wonder why you wade through the same history twice? Because Kings is a prophetic book, as we'll see this afternoon, and Chronicles is a priestly book, written for an entirely different purpose. But we'll explain that this afternoon. Well, now God took another hand. He introduced me to tapes and audio cassettes when I was passage preaching. Then he got me into books when I was burden preaching. But now that I was book preaching, he opened radio and television wide. I'm on Sky twice a week teaching the Bible. It's an unnerving experience to be stopped in the street by complete strangers. Saw you last night. <laughs> but they, but they, <laughs> they tell me what effect it's having on their own Bible study. Over a hundred radio stations in Australia picked it up. And I've never had such a huge congregation in my life. And looking back, I just see that the Lord put his hand on passage preaching, on burden preaching, and now on book preaching. And I just ask the Holy Spirit to show you whether that has anything to say to you in your situation. I'm going to finish in just two minutes on a negative note. There is one kind of preaching I have never got into. I call it gospel preaching. I've literally never been able to preach a gospel sermon. You know what I mean. John 3.16 plus Revelation 3.20. That kind of sermon. I just can't do it. I've tried. I've been asked too many times and I just find I'm quite incapable. And I wrote down four reasons why I think... I've never got into it. Number one, I'm a teacher, not an evangelist. Preacher is not one of the ascension gifts to the church. Evangelist is, and an evangelist is someone who preaches the gospel to the unbeliever. And I've stayed within my gifting. That doesn't mean I have not seen evangelistic results. Glory to God alone, but we rarely had a Sunday when people were not converted. Though I never made an appeal once. And we had had to have baptisms every single month. I found that the word preached totally. Sometimes the most surprising word convicts people of sin and righteousness and judgment. We had more conversions when I preached through Ecclesiastes than any other book. And Leviticus has been one of the most influential books I've ever, ever preached on, believe it or not. But I also believe it's because I've never been able to accept what's called a simple gospel. My gospel is much bigger than Christ died for you. My gospel includes the resurrection and the ascension and his return. I've never been able to condense it into a simple gospel talk. That's a confession. Others have been able to, but I can't do it. So there are seven kinds of preaching. The Lord led me through six of them. I don't know what he has in store for me yet. I've asked him if I can serve him till I'm 80, and then we'll reconsider it. <laughs> but I don't know. But I'm as busy as ever. I just thank the Lord that preaching is something I love to do. Feeding hungry people is so satisfying. Like a meal, it may take hours to prepare and it's eaten in 20 minutes, but it's worth it. When you see people grow and mature and get a bit of ballast in them, there is a desperate need worldwide 
for presenting the whole truth, the whole Bible, the whole Word of God. Thank you for listening.